Hey, hello everyone. Um, I'm Isla. Um, I'm an environmental activist from London. And just a bit about me, it was kind of bats that started my journey into conservation and activism. Because I've been a member of the Bat Conservation Trust for almost four years now. And one of the best things about lockdown has been getting involved with Action for Conservation. And thanks to them, I have learned loads about conservation and activism. And I've even seen my first greater horseshoe bat roost last summer. And I look forward to learning even more about bats and women in conservation as this event goes on. So that's a bit about me. I'm going to start by introducing each of the panelists and asking them a bit about themselves and how they got where they are today. So I'm going to start with Professor Kate Jones, who is the Chair of Ecology and Biodiversity at the University College in London. Kate, can you tell us about your journey into bat science? <laughs> Thanks very much and, and uh, I'm really honoured to be part of the panel. It's fantastic to be here. Um, so how I got into bat science? Well, I got into science because um, when I was 13, I watched Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And I thought, I totally want to do that. That sounds awesome. But that was also really like David Attenborough. So I thought I could be a cross between Indiana Jones and David Attenborough. Which of course, I'm not at all. But, you know, that was in my head thinking that's what a science life could be. And then I got into bats because um, when I was doing my undergrad degree in Leeds, there was a, a professor there that was really just loved bats, like thought they were brilliant and um, did this whole series of lectures about how brilliant bats were. And they, they really do highlight a whole load of really unusual adaptations and evolution and really interesting conservation questions as well. So I just got completely hooked. But what really got me was when he took us on a little field trip to North York Moors and he got um, a little bat out, a pippa trail bat out of a bat box. And he, he kind of, we were just counting them and looking at the rings and stuff. And um, he put it in my hand and it just sat in my hand and it was like, yeah, what do you, what do you want? You know, why are you, and I was like, these are so cool. They're so cool. Oh my God, they're so cool. And I just, that was it. That was it. And then it's just totally out of hand now. <laughs> I've been working on that for like 30 years. <laughs> that sounds really cool. I'd love to be able to hold a bat one day. And um, next we have Kat Walsh, who's the Senior Specialist of Mammal Ecology with Natural England. So Kat, what first drew you to the bat world and how did you end up doing what you currently do? So actually similar to Kate, <laughs> so I'm glad TV has inspired both of us. <laughs> Not the same TV, I have to say, but similar. So um, yeah, I, I was obsessed with all animals and nature and the environment in general when I was a lot younger than I am now. And I, I loved all creatures great and small. That was the programme that inspired me. I used to, you know, the original version, not the one that's on Channel 5 now, <laughs> many moons ago. Um, I used to love watching that. Similarly, David Attenborough programmes, any David Attenborough programme that was on, I'd be hooked. And, you know, fortunately, my parents um, liked going out into the countryside as well. So we'd often go out on walks. So that, you know, in the early stages, I just had an interest in, in the environment and animals. Um, and then latterly, I went on to do two environmental degrees, although I still haven't gone into the bat world just then. So again, it was still away from me, um, that particular aspect. Various other mammals and botany um, side of things, but, but, but not um, bats. I kind of stumbled into the bat world, really. Um, so when I, I've had a, many different jobs in, in the, the environmental field over the years and when I started working for the Cheshire Wildlife Trust I'd go off to various different events um, around the country on uh, for different reasons but I, I came across the Nottinghamshire Bat Group and they were going to be running a training a sort of weekend introductory training course um, so I went off to Clumber Park with them and I just got absolutely hooked from that point onwards. It was just fascinating. Um, you know, I was really proud of myself that I found a natural bat in, <laughs> in a cave. So I was like, oh, look at me, this is great. Um, so it's just fascinating, you know, join Cheshire Bat Group, who I've been with for so many years now. Um, and it's just gone on from there, rather like Kate, it just, once you're in, 
that this field you just stay in and you continue to be interested and you know you go abroad and do interesting things in different countries and and see you know the different bat species there so yeah thanks Kat um next we have Gail Armstrong and Gail is part of North Lancashire Bat Group and she is a volunteer bat worker and a bat carer um Gail how did you get involved with bats I went on a bat walk <laughs> um, and I wasn't passionate as a child. I grew up on a council estate in a town. I didn't have opportunities really. I'm a lot older than everybody else here. I didn't have opportunities really to get out into the countryside because we didn't drive a car and uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so I was actually in my mid thirties before I'd even been on a bat walk or seen a bat. So that probably makes me a bit um, of a late comer. And, um, and I got involved then quite slowly. I think that's just the way I am. I take my time to get involved in things uh, and joined the back group and then started doing stuff. Eventually, some uh, somebody says, oh, there's a battle um, in Wigan. Can you go and pick it up? And you've done that and checked it over and let it go. And basically, I'm, I, I felt and still feel I'm just one page ahead of most people in the bat book. So uh, that makes me an expert. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Gail. I think probably a lot of us here have been on a bat walk and that's got us interested. Um, next, we have Dr. Parvati Venagopal and Parvati is the Bat Conservation Trust National Bat Monitoring Programme Survey Coordinator. Um, can you tell us about your journey into bat conservation? Hi, uh, thanks, Ayla. Yes, I think um, it, it's kind of same as what Kate or Kat shared with us. It's, it's kind of similar. But I would say the story of my journey into this field um, falls into a hate love genre. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, let me tell you why. So I um, grew up and studied in a small village uh, in Kerala, which is in the southern part of India. And in my school, we had these classrooms, they had tiled roofs, and in the roof crevices, there is this unwelcome guest living there. So these little tiny black creatures, they often, most, almost every day, they stained my perfectly ironed blue and black uniform with their poo and <laughs> urine. And trust me, in my school days, I. I didn't like them at all. I just, I just hated them. <laughs> but uh, that years passed uh, once I finished my schooling. But I always have this uh, interest in nature or in things involved with people or environment. So I wanted to do something related to that during my undergrad or my higher education. Um, so I chose this course called Forestry for my undergrad degree, where I got introduced by one of the professors into this fascinating world of bats and from there yeah it's just continuing so I took my master's and I came here to do my PhD and once I finished my PhD I applied for a job at PCT so it's right now I'm in a stage where I can combine my you know passion where I can do kind of public citizen science program and also work in the same field which I studied so yeah <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Pavati. And um, last but not least, we have Annie Bennett. And Annie is one of BCT's trustees and is also a professional ecologist. So Annie, you were involved with bats as a volunteer and a professional. So did one come first and how did you get involved with bats? Um, yeah, the, the volunteering came first. Um, I mean, a bit like um, Kate and Kat, it was a kind of, from when I was tiny, I was interested in wildlife and stuff. and. Both my parents were biology teachers when I was growing up and amateur naturalists and we were just out mostly looking at herbs to be fair rather than bats or anything but um, always had that interest. Veered off slightly at uni and did environmental chemistry for some reason <laughs> and then after uni I went travelling and ended up uh, volunteering at a bat hospital in Australia um, and just got hooked really. Um, got back to Jersey, joined the back group, started doing volunteer surveys and things, and then um, kind of somehow ended up in um, consultancy and things after a while by basically just helping other people out and doing seasonal surveys and things. And then um, 
yeah now somehow work full time mostly doing bats <laughs> but uh, yeah it's been quite the quite a long journey and not one that i was expecting when i started out but yeah it's been good it's, as the others have said once you get into bats you just kind of get a bit stuck for some reason yeah definitely um and now we've kind of heard a bit about all of our panelists we're going to start with the questions so first question i have is that Compared to some other sectors, women are actually quite well represented within the conservation sector. And everyone here, you represent a number of different facets of bat science and conservation. So do you agree that women are well represented in your area? Or do you think there are other areas where you feel women are underrepresented? I'll, I'll say in the bat group world, women are represented in all uh, areas of, uh, of volunteer stuff, absolutely all areas. And I found when I first joined the bat group, uh, it struck me how easy it was and how welcoming it was. Uh, and I don't know if I was just lucky up north or if that's the case ever. I think I, I, I'm pretty sure it is the case everywhere. I think in um, in consultancy, there's a lot of female um, ecologists and bat speci specialists, but most of them are at kind of the lower levels. The, the one area that they're slightly underrepresented is in kind of director and principal ecologist level roles, whilst kind of senior downwards, there's loads of females, those kind of top jobs are mostly taken by males still. Yeah, I, I would just jump in if I can and, and agree there and say, you know, that there is representation across the board, but those senior jobs are really, really difficult for, for women uh, to get into. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about why that is, but, um, you know, there's only a very small percentage of women that are actually professors in this country and you know and across the world so it's it's a very small uh, minority of people who are professors that are female and that's you know that's a product of how difficult it is and how um kind of you know, I'm not trying to be a, a rampant feminist but the kind of the setup for science and progression in science is is quite traditionally focused. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's still, it's still largely focused on women looking after children and men going to work. So that is changing. And, you know, we're doing a lot more about that and recognizing where the, where the pinch points are and, and supporting people and making sure that we have family friendly policies, not women friendly. It is, you know, the whole family is taking responsibility and, and I do think we can't have more women in science until we have more men with babies. So that, that's my little pitch. <laughs> so I, I would agree. It's just like there's, there's hardly any women at these top levels, although it's changing. Yeah, um, I would say speaking from a statutory nature conservation organization point of view, that again, women are very well represented. Um, certainly across natural England and I would say it's true of, of other similar organisations, Natural Resources Wales, Nature Scott, Environment Agency. Um, I would have said just a few years ago, similarly to what others have said, at the director type level, um, there weren't, there wasn't as much representation and that's changing. It's certainly changing. Um, and, you know, our chief executive is a woman and in fact when Natural England came into being we had a, a different woman at the head of Natural England then. Um, so it is changing, it's very positive. Um, also so within our organisation there are several different strands, you know, not just to enable um, women to get to get on but um, looking at ethnic um, minority issues, um, any gender bias issues, uh, there's an awful lot, well, <laughs> I say this flexibility, so she's just put a, I'm not here because I'm doing loads of work and please don't bother me <laughs> at the moment, email out internally. <laughs> but, but there is, you know, flexibility um, within um, the organisation. You can work flexible hours, um, you can operate at different times. So it, it, it's an awful lot better than it used to be. But as others have said, there's still a fair way to go. Yeah, I completely agree with what Kiat just says because I'm also working in a conservation charity in PCT and where we have more 
women than men as staff uh, and also a senior management team and also I think we are consciously taking efforts to keep our board of trustees uh, to represent a um, balanced representation of gender identity, which is good. And I think that's this kind of same trend when we speak from the UK perspective. Um, but I guess uh, things are promising in the UK, but if I look back in India or Asia or you know, Italy or Cyprus, or even in the US, this is not the case because, um, so I was chatting to my friend, the one in the US, and she's working in a same charity organization. She was saying they don't have any maternity leave or things like that. So it comes to, when it comes to those areas, it's a bit tricky and it, it depends on where you are working or which country are you working. Um, but things are changing, so hopefully, within the next few years. And also, um, since I'm representing the National Bad Monitoring Program, if we take the volunteer um, profile, we have more female volunteers in the program than uh, males. But when we consider the diversity within that female, I don't think that is the true representation of the society. So you don't have, you know, other ethnic minority groups. So I think that's actually a completely different topic to discuss. Um, but yeah. yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I feel like we've got a variety there because a lot of people have said, oh, there's a lot of women, but then some senior roles aren't having as many women. And then it just depends where you are. And that kind of leads into the next question, which is going back to the title of the discussion, which is, what do you all feel are the opportunities and challenges facing women and girls in bat science conservation? So if we start with the challenges and then we can move on to the opportunities and hopefully finish on a positive note. So yeah, what are the challenges facing women and girls in bat science and conservation? So um, one thing that um, I wonder about, and this is maybe to the rest of the panel really and to the people on the chat, is that there is a, a kind of, um, you know, I, I think this is changing, but you know, girls are traditionally told that they're not very good at maths and science and, you know, not that great at doing those things. And therefore, when you get told you're not very good, it's kind of this self-perpetuating thing that you then think, oh, I'm not very good at maths. I'm not very good at kind of, you know, stuff like that. And a lot of the bat world is around tech. It's around tech and it's around sensors and it's around acoustics and it's around machine learning and it's around going out in the field at night. It's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's quite a technical field. Uh, it can be anyway. I mean, there are parts of it which are, and are, are kind of more about a caring role, but I think a lot of the science is quite technical. And I, I, I just wonder whether that might be a barrier for some girls just thinking that get, they get told at a young age that they're not very good at that. And maybe that's a barrier. I don't know what anybody else thought. Do they still get told that they're not good at maths? I don't know. But, uh, I would hope not, not as much as when I went to school anyway. But um, yeah, I think you're right. And, and I think even in the bat world, there's more the techie side. Um, when you read the discussions, say on the Facebook group, the techie side is mostly men <laughs> talking in a lot of detail. Um, and the bat care, uh, groups are mostly women although there's you know not all not exclusively so I think you're probably right yeah. I have um, another take on this as well for, for challenges um, in that um, if you if you're going out in the field this has ha happened to me in the past you, you go out in the field and um, you're having to deal with say a landowner who isn't as accepting as you would like them to be um, and they are expecting the traditional white male of a certain age to come along and present their views and they can be quite unhappy if they see somebody like me <laughs> so that, um, there's almost a you know they're not believing what you're saying because of who you are what you look like so that's another take on challenges in, in a particular area um, to do with conservation generally, I would say this isn't just a, a bat related issue. 
Yeah, I think we have that a lot working in consultancy because, I mean, we, we talk to a lot of landowners, but the other thing, that one of the big challenges is actually around contractors because when we're doing like the licensed work and you're on a building site and they're expecting kind of some beefy bloke to turn up and help them strip the roof or be, a girl turns up, they expect me to just sit at the bottom of the scaffold. Like the, the comments you get sometimes just going up the ladder and you're just like, well, no, this is my job. This is what I do on a daily basis. Like I've probably stripped as many roofs as, as you have. And it's, there's always that kind of initial barrier, but it can, there is a kind of two way street to it sometimes, um, as it's probably more the opportunities for later, but it's once you've kind of proven yourself, they can then be more receptive to you than maybe they would to a male colleague because there's less of a kind of competition there they're kind of like okay you've proven yourself i'll i'll listen to you now rather than going you know i'm better than you um type thing so it's yeah it's a bit of a bit of to and fro but certainly the landowners and going onto land on your own can be a little scary at times <laughs> there's like loan working in general is obviously quite frowned upon anyway but there's there's a certain thing of if you've got two men going or a man and a woman going, it seems to you tend to feel a bit safer than if it's just two girls going out into a woodland in the middle of the night, for example. It's there's a whole kind of perception about it, even if physically you're not in any more danger, you can feel like you are. So it's yeah, it can be quite uh worrying sometimes. But then again, on on the flip side, sometimes people are less aggressive to you because you are turning up as a girl rather than a scary man. Yeah, I completely agree with what all the other panelists said. And um, I think in general, this can be professional, personal, and more or less individual based, all the challenges that we encounter. Um, so I think in a very general term, we can put into this like what you are doing, because the challenges if as a researcher, as an academician, or as a person working in an NGO, can be completely different to one another. And also if you're doing the same role and it can vary if you're doing, like if you're a researcher in the UK, then you are facing a different challenges than a researcher from India or Italy or Cyprus or Asia. Uh, so I did my, um, most of my field works during my PhD uh, was in India and Sri Lanka. So the main problems I found all my colleagues or friends in the, working in the same field found, finding are mainly when it's safety and it um, comes to regarding going at night doing field surveys and it's quite sad you know uh, you have to change your working pattern or feel, decide your field survey site based on how accessible the site is at night how safe it is and who is coming with you as a field assistant if it's a female then you have to change your plans accordingly and if you if you have a male assistant that's a bit more safe but that shouldn't be uh, the thing that you often get because uh, you can't stick around just one person as coming as field assistant all the time. Um, and the second one, I think this is the important one we all feel is that we don't, uh, people don't take us seriously in the field by the field assistants or the people. Um, like the attitude is completely different if my male colleague go there and catch bats and talk to them. And if I am doing the same job, then it's a completely different attitude from the public or the field assistants, which is really annoying sometimes. <laughs> uh, I guess that's the most important challenge uh, we are still facing. But I can see this is changing, the trend is changing. And one interesting thing my friend mentioned the other day when I was talking to her, do you have any you know, experiences to share or challenges to share. And she was telling, um, you know, people look at you or people get attracted to you in the field, not because you are a female or a woman, because what you wear, because the villages, if you go to a very rural area, and if they are not familiar with the type of, you know, trousers or shorts or things that you wear just for the convenience, and they just come around you and look at you in a very strange way, <laughs> which is sometimes bothers her. 
And um, also in Asia, most of the bat roasting sites would be in old temples or the sacred places. So there are places where you won't allow uh, to go into the temple because you are a female. Uh, but at the same time, there are some places where um, neither male or female can go into some places. But it's, when it comes to um, women, that's more kind of restrictions when it comes to that kind of cultural barriers. Um, yeah, I can, I can talk about this for another hour, but I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, um, the, the kind of perception of who is in charge is often, I mean, you know, when I've, um, as a senior, I've taken out a male junior colleague and people look to him and I'm like, well, no, I'm, I'm the one giving you the answers here. It doesn't matter if he's then repeating it. It's me you need to listen to because I am the one that's giving you the information. And it's, there's, I mean, there's a lot of things that is changing in a lot of places and it does depend on kind of what site you're on and who you're talking to and things and it varies a lot and I think it has improved over the years but it is still something of an issue but I think there's there's also a lot of invisible things that people just don't think of in terms of being a woman in working outdoors and things so one of the massive ones I know for field workers is facilities whilst you're menstruating I mean, if there's no toilets or anything, it's it's easy enough to go and wee behind a bush, but it's uh, more difficult for other things. Shall we say. <laughs> and there's, you know, you're out um, radio tracking all night, for example. It's just, you know, you just have to deal with it because there isn't, there aren't any facilities. There's no way that you can have a kind of portaloo trailed behind you the whole time. So it's, but they're things that nobody ever mentions and nobody really kind of raises as as a possible issue um so there's it's i think it's still quite taboo in a lot of places as well to kind of you know we like to ignore that time of the month um but it, it is a big problem for a lot of people and um there used to be a lot of ecology companies that would expect you to sleep in your car between dust storm surveys for example rather than giving you a hotel and it's yeah it, it just makes it potentially you've got 24 hours without access to proper facilities which isn't the easiest at the best of times, but yeah, can be particularly tricky if you are menstruating. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's not always the easiest. I was just gonna come in with an anecdote, I think that's about, about this topic, uh, which was that my friend Kate Barlow, who sadly died a few years ago, but she was the first woman to overwinter on Bird Island. So she, she was a bat biologist, but she had a segue in penguins. She didn't really approve of, but you know, okay, fine for a little while. So she was the first woman to overwinter and she was with two blokes and um, they hadn't packed any, like this whole station, no menstrual facilities, any anything at all. So she had to radio this very, very proper, <laughs> proper, uh, you know, commander in chief person in the army to ask for some, <laughs> some actual sanitary pads to be posted down to the Antarctic because they hadn't thought of it at all. So that was where we were. And that was only 20 years ago or something. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. And kind of going back to what we were saying about technology being more dominated by men, obviously this isn't conservation, but in my school, I think as a young person, definitely we have a lot more male maths teachers, more science teachers. And so I chose my GCSEs last year. And I think definitely there's a lot more boys choosing to do computer science or subjects like that. I think, yeah, it's definitely like what you guys have been saying. And yeah, now let's move on to the positives. So like, what are the opportunities facing women and girls in conservation? Well, if you want to be a volunteer, there's plenty. And I know I'm in that side of things and not a professional, um, but volunteering back care and roost visiting which are both volunteer activities, is where you learn a hell of a lot about bats, if that's what you want to do. I would agree with Gail. I think there's, there's, there's so many opportunities. You know, bats are a kind of segue into all kinds of things like science, technology, biology, aging, viruses, pandemics. You know, like there's so much stuff there. You know, people, citizen science, community engagement. There's a, 
so I love them you know they have this kind of effect on people <laughs> I can't explain it but it's it is just infectious and it's wonderful and I think you know I've traveled all over the world I've done loads of different things because of them you know and and, and I've had a blast you know a total blast so I think there's huge opportunities for, for women as as for men and for other genders yeah I think in definitely in the UK there's there's so many opportunities for women in in that science in general because there aren't really although we've, we've talked about various barriers and things there's not there's no kind of barrier to starting there's no back groups don't kind of go no you're a woman you can't join anybody can join them and when you get into it in the same with like consultancies and things like we're not we're not choosing junior ecologists based on their gender identity we're just you know if they've got an interest and they've got some knowledge and skill and you know we're, we're basing it on that whilst there is still this kind of glass ceiling of not so many directors and things that is slowly changing and more women are, are starting their own consultancies so that there are you know more higher up roles a lot of it is um kind of perception and people kind of changing the idea that we can't reach that level because actually there aren't physically those barriers anymore it's a lot of it is mental barriers and and thinking that you can't do it but actually we can do i mean as the panel kind of shows and bct is got a female ceo and you know female ceo at um uh natural england and things and there's you know there's there are the opportunities there um with like kate's proven you can be a professor so you know we're we're looking at the young generations to to come up and go oh actually they've done it i can go a step further than they did and just kind of you know just start at the bottom and encourage them to come in and you, you can go all the way up you just have to put the effort in i would absolutely i haven't got much more to add to what you guys have all said because i completely agree with you um getting into um this field of work now um, there are so many more opportunities than they used to be certainly with volunteering but even start trying to start out on a, in a professional basis there are many many more opportunities and also for those considering going to university there are so many more biological courses than there used to be just when I went to university <laughs> and I'm not that old <laughs> but, um, but there's just such an awful lot more opportunity and there are more opportunities elsewhere outside of the UK as well whether it be Europe whether it be much further afield than there ever used to be um, so it's certainly very positive getting up to, to that level is as we've said that it does seem to be a bit of the, the glass ceiling um, but it, it's changing so yes yeah, it, I would say it's positive positive now and continues to be positive and things are changing I don't think I have anything more than to add on to that one but um, looking back so I came from a small village from a different part of the world all the way to the UK um, and also when I look back so I did my undergrad in 2007 and at that time in India I think it's, still, it's the same but similar the case uh, so most of my friends uh, were choosing either engineering or uh, you know medic medicine degree and it's this kind of society where your parents choose the career for you or the parents want you to choose something which gives you kind of consistency um, in the job way, so which pays you a higher salary. So during that time, um, a big thanks to my parents because they helped me to follow my passion. And of course, I had to go on through so many hurdles, like culturally or Otherwise, um, so if anybody in the audiences can relate um, to me, then um, I would say I'm very optimistic that the world is changing, so there are more opportunities. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting and really nice to go back to the positives. Um, so last question, Ray, um, could each of you give just a really short piece of advice that you would give to someone thinking about getting into bats, so maybe a young person like me considering a future in bat work, or a woman who might be contemplating a career change, or someone who wants to start volunteering. 
So if anyone wants to start, just a short piece of advice. Join your local back group. Yep, similar. Join the local back group, join your local mammal group, your local wildlife trust. Um, and don't be afraid to ask. That's what I would say. They, people can only say no, and there are lots of other groups out there. So, you know, don't be afraid to pick up the phone, knock on the doors, use social media. <laughs> That's another great thing about these days. You know, there's so much, so much going on in social media. So, yeah, don't be afraid. Just go for it. Yeah, definitely don't be afraid to ask. There's so many, even once you're in a back group, people have so many different projects and just ask them if you can come along. Even if it's not your back group, if somebody's doing a project you're interested in, send them a message on Facebook, you know, send them an email, just get in touch with them and say, can I come and visit your project? Nine times out of 10, they will say yes. Um, and that's how you get more and more experience and just meet lots of very crazy people. Yeah, and in the fact they'll find you'll find out more times that often than not that they're waiting for you to get in contact with them and will snap your hand, and, you know, take you as quickly as possible. So don't don't think you're too busy to volunteer. I think that's what a lot of people join back groups and they're very well intentioned, but then get caught up in the world of work. But volunteering is where you learn your bread and butter stuff if you want to get into bats. So don't be too busy to volunteer. So uh, I just want, I just want to add maybe just a, a thought about intersectionality between, you know, race and gender, because I think that, um, you know, uh, poverty, because a lot of people who, who would like to get interested and involved can't afford to volunteer. So that's just something to, to think about as, you know, something that we need to bear in mind when we, we talk about volunteering, that that's a very ex kind of exclusive if you've got enough income to do that. And I think that's something that as a society we need to address and think about how to get uh, more underrepresented groups in into conservation and in, in science in general. So I think that's something that is still a challenge. And so when, when I hear that, I, I kind of just feel a little bit uncomfortable about volunteering and um, we need to make sure that there are routes in for people that can't afford to do that. Not that volunteer is bad, just, just, just to have that in mind when, when we talk about it. Yeah, it's the same I wanted to add actually. So um, even in the UK, uh, among this other minority background communities, among the parents, there is this still this stigma exists with working in the environmental sector or charity sector. Of course, I think one of the main reasons the low pay scale could be, that's my hypothesis, but I don't know. Uh, so yeah, things need to be changed from a cult cultural perspective also, which I know will take time. But I think, um, like I'd, maybe I go back to my stories because I started with a kind of very unpleasant experience with bats. <laughs> but I would say, even if you have a bad memory associated with it, or your perception might not be that great with bats earlier, but if you give a chance, then that can be changed. So uh, it's entirely up to you. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. I think it's really important, especially that we're doing this, because now people can see that there are people, there are women who have done this, and. It's really inspiring. And now I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. And I think Naomi is going to, Naomi or Andrea are going to be asking. Yeah, no, we've, we've heard some great thanks, Isla. Um, first of all, um, a few comments um, uh, after, uh, particularly after Annie mentioned menstruation and some of these particular challenges uh, that women are facing. Um, just some um, thank yous for saying um, that Annie Anika raises really important points here. Yes, thank you, Annie, for raising this. Um, a big cheer for that mention of women's monthly cycles. It can be uncomfortable in a bloke dominated environment to raise basic human needs that males don't experience when doing science field work. It can also be an issue with pregnancy and needing more frequent loo breaks on field work, with needing flexible, for example, part time working in order to be able to continue nursing an infant, and again around issues around perimenopause. Uh, as the ecology consultancy industry, uh, 
relies so much on subcontractors, if you can't do the full time hours, you can easily get cancelled. Um, so uh, almost touching again on some of those financial um, barriers that it can um, link around to even further into your career. Um, so we then had, um, uh, and thank you to everyone, so to, to Lisa, to Joe, and to full stop, <laughs> someone's coming as the full stop. Um, uh, and then we've got um, Kiana J has asked, um, uh, Annika for consultancy, how do you get into it as a woman? I mean, we have touched on the volunteer routes into it. Um, um, I think other than volunteering, the kind of most frequent route that people go in is as a seasonal surveyor. Um, so they come in in the summer and do bat surveys and um, I know quite a lot of people that have done that for a couple of years and then have kind of ended up in a full time role for one of those consultancies that they work for. Um, and it's it's often particularly if people are trying to kind of change career or they're coming to the end of university or anything like that, then they can do that over the summer um, just on the odd evening a week, couple of evenings a week um, and fit it around other full-time work or other um, kind of responsibilities and things and kind of get into it that way and once you've got that experience and you've got those contacts it's a lot easier to to then land a kind of more permanent role um, because you've already got the experience and you've kind of shown that um, you've got the dedication to do it effectively. Um, volunteering and stuff is obviously the, the other thing that gives you a lot of experience and will give you a lot of contacts as well because there's most of the back groups have got commercial ecologists as their members um, and they'll go out and do volunteer surveys and if you can kind of meet them on one of those volunteer surveys and get chatting to them you can often then kind of get yourself a job that way just by kind of who you know um, in effect um, but the I mean if you don't know any one the way to do it really is look out now for all of the job adverts that are out there for seasonal surveyors and just start applying and if you can um even if you've got no experience yet if you can show that you're interested and and you you know you're willing to go out and do the slightly weird hours that are required by bat surveyors then you will get yourself a job effectively because we always need loads of people over the summer um yeah and then just build it up from there. And Annie, just for anyone that might be wondering, what sort of um, knowledge or skills um, might these adverts be looking for? Will they be looking for someone with a degree or what sort of things do you think they need? To um, for seasonal surveyors, it's generally speaking a uh, willingness to stand and stare at a building for a few hours in the dark. Um, and um, just kind of the ability to concentrate really you don't need a degree to, to be a bat surveyor you don't actually need any qualifications to come in as a seasonal surveyor um i mean i got my first job as an ecologist having done an environmental chemistry degree which i did a, an aquatic ecology unit was the only ecology i did during my degree and then i got a job as a seasonal bat surveyor um and i say it's as long as you're willing to stand there you can concentrate and that you've got enough technical know-how that you can work out how to use the bat detector um, but generally speaking every consultancy will do at least one training session at the start of the season and depending on different consultancies work it differently some of them you'll have a few training sessions that are kind of fake surveys at like their headquarters or whatever others will kind of send you out with their more experienced surveyors and and basically you stand with them and they kind of talk you through the process whilst doing the survey so you're there live and you're seeing it all it's a bit different depending on you know what consultancy it is but you don't actually need any knowledge in the first place it's just you know a willingness to learn and um if you've got some vague musical ability it can help with determining what bats are flying around because um, I mean it's slightly different now a lot of people have like the echo meters with the, the calls on the screens but certainly when I started it was using heterodyne detectors and listening to the the different um, quality to the the call so whether it's a very short clicked call or a more kind of drop sound can help you determine what bat species it is generally now all consultancies your detector will be recording the calls anyway so it doesn't actually matter if you don't know but it can be quite useful to have a note going, I think it sounded like a pip. 
Um, and so, yeah, so slight musical ability to learn to recognise those different sounds can be useful, but you don't actually need any qualifications in the first place. You can you can gain them all once you're in consultancy if needs be. And there are opportunities, and there will be more in um, desk-based roles, won't there? Sound analysis and infrared analysis, and so on. So you don't have to be someone who you know stands out in a field all night. <laughs> And those yeah. opportunities, I think, will increase. Yeah, I mean, for for our consultancy, at least, we are we tend to um, have some seasonal staff that they're on a contract for the whole season, and they'll come in and do the surveys, and then they'll also do um, the video analysis a lot because we use infrared cameras for everything, and we'll teach them how to use the software for that, and then they watch the footage after the survey and make the notes of the bats. It takes a bit longer to learn the sound analysis skills, but certainly once somebody's had a season or two, even if it's just going through and picking out the common pips and saying there's something on this file that I don't know what it is, so somebody else can look at it, helps me a lot. I mean, I've, I've got so much other high level stuff to do that being able to have those trainees kind of learning from the ground up effectively and being able to help with that analysis and things is really, really useful. Um, so yeah, basic computer skills are quite handy yeah. if you want to go up a level. <laughs> I, I also think, you know, those computer skills are, are going to be more and more in need, you know, and I think there are huge bits of legislation coming through, um, as Kat knows, <laughs> that um, mean that we will need to, you know, transform or, or understand better what we're doing to our landscape in terms of capturing carbon. For our carbon targets but also uh, setting aside lots of areas for wildlife to cap for our wildlife targets so you'll need to understand how uh, well we're doing that and one of the ways is by monitoring and and bats are an important part of the landscape so there's going to be a really i think a massive um a massive kind of uptick on the need for these kinds of surveys and these kinds of skills and they're becoming more and more technical. So with, you know, machine learning, with sensors, and I think that, you know, having, you know, get, get, getting some of those skills is really, really important for the coming, for the coming few years. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions that sort of overlap, so I'm going to share them together. Um, so there was, I'd like to know how people um, cope with, how people with children cope with working out of hours and the, the issues related to that. Um, and there was also one um, sort of a, on a similar thing about as a student, I had much, lots of time for volunteering and engaging in the field. However, now with a full time job, less time for batty activities, any advice on how to keep all the plates spinning at once? So it's different pulls on time, but, you know, whether yet, yeah, whether it's children or whether it is trying to balance volunteering and um, work, any suggestions for our audience? It's, it's difficult. <laughs> Um, so I have two children, so um, I have to try and balance those and my husband works full time as well. So luckily they're now at school, so it's it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, but certainly when um, they were both little, I so I got my first um, consultancy role as a, as a kind of permanent position when my daughter was only nine months old. Um, so there was there was a lot of juggling and I was still breastfeeding her at the time and things so it was it was working around that and I managed to get um, flexible hours essentially so I would work um, during the school hours so my son was at school um, and we got kind of wraparound care for my daughter so that I could go out and do surveys during the day I would then pick um, my son up from school at three o'clock have the rest of the afternoon um, to you know parent things um, and then my husband would get home at half five six o'clock and I would basically hand off the kids to him and go out and do the bat surveys in the evening so um, it was very much a team effort and it's you you need that support network if you haven't I was very lucky and I'm still very lucky in that in that my husband will um, quite happily have let me abandon him for the entire summer doing bat work um, and he'll sort the kids out and he um he works from home now and he has the flexibility that he can go and do the school run 
um, and he takes that as his lunch break. But it's don't try and do it on your own, I think would be my my primary advice. You need you need that support network in place because otherwise you will burn yourself out very rapidly. And I say this from experience, despite having the support network. Um, and just try not to do too much. Know your own limits and know um, what you can and can't do effectively, because it's really easy to just go, yes, I'll do this, yes, I'll do this, yes, I'll do this. And then suddenly you're six weeks into the summer and you've had four hours sleep. <laughs> That's in total, not per night. Um, so it is, it's very easy to do too much. So you just have to be a bit careful and, and just recognise that you will drop plates we all drop them and don't punish yourself for that just try and try and juggle it so it works for you um and most employers now will do flexible working um and it it varies by it varies by company it varies by sector um certainly in consultancy most companies now have flexible working policies and they'll have part part-time roles for people um and I mean, in, we have full flexible, full flexi time in the company that I work in. So we basically, we are contracted for 40 hours a week, but it's up to us how we manage that time. We sort our own projects out and, you know, so we can work it around our own commitments. Um, but in the summer, you will do a lot more work than you would in the winter, because that's when we're going out at night and doing the survey. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just knowing knowing when you can do what and and finding somebody that will let you work how you need to work some of the larger consultancies have got crashes and things that can help you with childcare. so it's you know you just you have to find the place that will work for you effectively um, but it is difficult and i'm so sorry that we've run out of time it's i've i think it's been fantastic so a uh, huge thanks to all of our panelists for sharing uh, your time um putting um all your sharing your experience and your your knowledge your advice with everyone it's been fantastic thank you so much uh, and a huge thanks to um isla our guest chair who has come in and i think has absolutely rocked it today so thank you very much to isla uh, finally thank you to everyone who has joined us today um it's been wonderful to have you here with us uh, and a particular thanks to everyone who donated um, towards all the, the proceeds from today's event are going towards the Kate Barlow Award uh, so thank you very much to everyone who donated for that as well. Uh, it is two o'clock I am going to wrap up now um, but thank you everyone I hope you have a good rest of International Day for Women and Girls in Science. <laughs>